Scripture reading is taken from Zechariah chapter 11, verses 1 to 17. May the Holy Spirit help us to read responsively. Open your doors, O Lebanon, that the fire may devour your cedars. Will, O Cyprus, for the cedar has fallen. For the glorious trees are ruined. Will, oaks of Bashan. For the thick forest has been felled. The sound of will of the shepherds, for their glory is ruined. The sound of the roar of the lions, for the tricket of the Jordan is ruined. Thus saith the Lord my God, become shepherd of the flock, doomed to slaughter. Those who buy them slaughter them and go unpunished. And those who sell them say, blessed be the Lord, I have become rich, and their own shepherds have no pity on them. For I will no longer have pity on the inhabitants of this land, declares the Lord. Behold, I will cause each of them to fall into the hand of his neighbor, and each into the hand of his king, and they shall crush the land, and I will deliver none from their hand. So I became the shepherd of the flock, doomed to be slaughtered by the sheep traders. And I took two staffs, one named Favor, the other I named Union, and I tended the sheep. In one month, I destroyed the three shepherds, but I became impatient with them, and they also detested me. So I said, I will not be your shepherd. What is to die, let it die. What is to be destroyed, let it be destroyed. And let those who are left devour the flesh of one another. And I took my staff favor, and I broke it, annulling the covenant that I had made with all the peoples. So it was annulled on that day. And the sheep traders who were watching me knew that it was the word of the Lord. Then I said to them, if it seems good to you, give me my wages. But if not, keep them. And they waited out as my wages, 30 pieces of silver. Then the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, the lordly price at which I was prized by them. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord, to the potter. Then I broke my second staff union, annulling the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. Then the Lord said to me, Take once more the equipment of a foolish shepherd. For behold, I am raising up in the land a shepherd who does not care for those being destroyed, or seek the young, or heal the maimed, or nourish the healthy, but devours the flesh of the fat ones tearing off even their hoops. Together. Woe, Woe to my, my worthless, worthless shepherd, shepherd who deserts, deserts the flock. flock. May, May the, the sword strike, strike his arm and his and right, right eye. Let, Let his, his arm be wholly withered, his, his right, right eye utterly, utterly blinded. blinded. Praise the Lord for his precious word. And before Pastor Dave comes to deliver us the Lord's word, let us spend some moment praying for our children who will be leaving for their class. Children, are you ready to pray? Let's talk to the Father in heaven. Our Father in heaven, please soften your children's hearts to see Jesus Christ and to hear their names being called by him. Please nurture them to know you. Thank you for blessing the parents and teachers with the privilege to raise and disciple your children. May their good works shine for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May go for your class, children.
Our Lord Messenger today is Pastor Dave. Well, let's give the parents and children a minute to get to their classes and for the parents to return. But in the meantime, it would be really, really helpful if you could keep your Bibles opened or switched on to Zechariah chapter 11. Continuing our series through the prophet Zechariah. So keep your Bibles to chapter 11 as we go through the whole chapter. Well, why don't we look to the Lord in prayer? Our Father in heaven, we ask that through your word and by your Holy Spirit, you show us Jesus. Amen. God is exceedingly jealous for his people. This is the consistent message we've been hearing throughout the book of Zechariah. God looks at his people his church, and he sees them as his precious possession, the apple of his eye and the jewel of his crown. He is exceedingly jealous for them. Over the last two weeks, we've heard that when God sees his people small and vulnerable, harassed and helpless, being taken advantage of by the bully nations of this world, when God sees his people oppressed, this God cannot help but have compassion. He hates seeing us like this. He longs to rescue, to build us up. He wants to make us strong. Our God wants to make every one of us stand tall and strong. For the Lord of hosts cares for his sheep. He has come to look after his flock. He will make them strong and glorious. Friends, to say that our God is jealous for us is to say he is utterly committed to our well-being. He values us so much, and he will do anything it takes to save, restore, and strengthen us. He values you so, so much. Do you believe this? Do you know this to be true? That our God is exceedingly jealous for his people, exceedingly jealous for you. But you know, there is one niggling question. If this God cares so much for his people, then why are they in such a mess? If this God is so committed to his people, then why are they now in such dire estate? Well, the short answer is, it was inevitable. The destruction of Jerusalem, says, the the destruction of Jerusalem was inevitable. As our text says, they are a flock doomed to slaughter. A flock doomed to slaughter. Well, let's get into today's passage to see what this means. This is how it begins. Open your doors, O Lebanon, that fire may devour your cedars. Wail, O Cyprus, for the cedar has fallen, for the glorious trees are ruined. Wail, oaks of Bashan, for the thick forest has been felled. 
the sound of the wail of the shepherds, for their glory is ruined. The sound of the roar of the lions, for the thicket of the Jordan is ruined. Very much like chapter 10, this chapter starts with a little poem or song, which gives us a hint into what the rest of the chapter is all about. The poem is a lament about trees. Did you see that? Cedars and cypress, glorious trees, oaks and forest. The poem is a sort of deforestation lament. These trees seem to represent God's overall blessing upon Israel. His protection and providence, his care. You can imagine it, right? Trees that shield Israel from outside forces and pre pressures. The cedar and cypress were heavily used in the temple. The region of Bashan represents wealth, and the Jordan was a strategic place for the military. But the lament is that God is going to burn all these trees down. He's going to remove his blessing, remove his care from Israel. And as God takes away his hand, listen. Listen to the wail of the shepherds because they are going to lose their glory or their rich pastures. They weep because they will lose their wealth. Listen, listen to the roar of the lions. Another way of describing leaders, the lions will roar because they lose the thicket or their lair. They lose the source of their food and their power. You get it? The poem implies that God will remove his care, Israel's riches will be burned, and the leaders will weep. God will remove his care, Israel's riches will be destroyed, and the leaders will wail and weep. So let's get into more detail. From poetry, God moves to drama. He asked Zechariah to perform a little skit. He asked Zechariah to act like a good shepherd, a good shepherd. Thus says the Lord my God, become a shepherd of the flock doomed to slaughter. Those who buy them, slaughter them and go unpunished. And those who sell them say, blessed be the Lord, I have become rich. And even their own shepherds have no pity on them. There's that phrase, doomed to slaughter. Why? Because the sheep have become traders. The sheep have become traders. They buy and sell one another. Those who buy slaughter and never feel guilty. Those who sell say, thanks be to God, he's the one making me rich. The people treat one another as commodities. Commodities to make themselves wealthy. They see one another as possessions, as merchandise to be used and abused. We see an example of this in the stories of Nehemiah, where the people were charging exorbitant prices, giving loans that none could repay, oppressing their own relatives with high interest, buying and selling their sons and daughters, making them into slaves. I mean, Nehemiah was furious with this. How dare you buy and sell your brothers? The nation of God became a place of profit. The house of God became a place of trade. God's church had become a house of trade. Worse still, God says, even the shepherds, the leaders of Israel, view their people as property. They don't care for the sheep. They have no concern for their needs. They don't feel compassion when they're in trouble. They never lifted a finger to help. The people are just a means for the leaders to increase in wealth. Friends, can I ask you to do something? Could you do this for me? Uh, turn to your left and then turn to your right. Do you mind? Turn to your left and turn to your right. How do you view the person sitting next to you? How do you view the person sitting next to you?
Well, our God views them as precious. God views his people as precious in his sight. The person sitting next to you is incredibly valuable in the eyes of the living God. In fact, do you mind? Could you say that to them? Could you turn to your left your, and your right and say, you are precious in the sight of God? Could you do that? Brother, sister, you are precious in the sight of God. See, once we start seeing each other as commodities or economic units or business opportunities, once we value each other merely by our productivity or utility in society or church, that's when things start going downhill. That's when destruction is inevitable. The minute we start seeing each other as commodities, valuing each other purely by productivity, that's when things start going downhill and destruction is inevitable. Look at what God says to his house of trade. I will no longer have pity on the inhabitants of this land, declares the Lord, because I will cause each of them to fall into the hand of his neighbor and each of them into the hands of his king and they shall crush the land. I will deliver none from their hand. Because you are like this, because you view one another as possessions, buying and selling each other as slaves with no remorse, even saying, I sanction such behavior, you know what? If that's what you want, go ahead. Go ahead. I will no longer care for the inhabitants of this land. He doesn't even call them his own people anymore, right? I will no longer care for the inhabitants of this land. Your punishment is, I'll let you do what you want. That's the scariest punishment of all, isn't it? When God hands us over to our own desire. He lets us do what we want to do. So scary. I'm going to give them over, God says, every one of them into the hand of his neighbor. I'm going to give them over, God says, every one of them into the hand of their compassionless kings. That's what you want, right? You want to become a nation of trade, just like the other nations. You want the church to be a place of power and profit. Well, go ahead then. Treat one another. I won't stop you. I won't stop you. And you know what's going to happen, right? Eventually, you know what will happen. You crush one another, oppress one another, and the whole land will be destroyed. As I said, you're a flock doomed to slaughter. But the slaughtering will be done by your own hand. You're a flock doomed to slaughter, but the slaughtering will be done by your own hand. Zechariah begins then to play out the skit. So I became shepherd of the flock doomed to be slaughtered by the sheep traders, and I took two staffs, one I named Favor, the other I named Union, and I tended the sheep. In one month, I destroyed three shepherds. Zechariah, acting as God, takes on the role of the good shepherd. He holds two staffs. One is favor, symbolizing God's blessing towards his people, his kindness, his absolute commitment of care. And the other is called union, which we later see represents the relationship between people, the brotherhood between sheep. One staff is the vertical relationship of God's care, favor, and the other is the horizontal relationship, the care we have for one another, union. And the first thing the good shepherd does is he quickly, in one month, destroys three evil shepherds. Now, we don't know who these evil leaders are. It could be the last three kings of Israel, 
or it could represent three particularly nasty leaders in Israel's history. But the point is that God cares so much, is so committed to the welfare of his people, that the first thing he does when he comes is to remove the uncaring, oppressive leaders. God will remove the existing leaders and he himself will take over as shepherd. He himself will take over as king. But look at what happens next. I became impatient with them and they too detested me. So I said, I will not be your shepherd. What is to die, let it die. What is to be destroyed, let it be destroyed. And whoever's left, let them devour the flesh of one another. The people, the sheep, hate their new king. They detest the good shepherd. Isn't that crazy? This God cares for them so much, values them so much, is exceedingly jealous and wants to do everything to build us up, make us flourish, make us strong. But the sheep don't want God as their shepherd king. I mean, if you read the Old Testament, this is not new. It has always been. Ever since the book of Samuel, the people reject God as their king. In fact, they've consistently stated their preference for worldly kings. Worldly kings that crave power and wealth and authority. Worldly kings that would transform Israel into a nation of trade and profit. But after so many rounds of rejection, the good shepherd gets fed up with his sheep. He gets impatient, or the word is really weary. I am so weary, I'm so tired of this. I keep coming to save you, I keep coming to deliver you from all these horrible and oppressive leaders, from the evil shepherds, but you don't want me? You don't want to listen to me? You don't want me in your life? You don't want me in charge? Fine, I won't be your shepherd then. You want to die, you go and die lah. That's what the living God says, right? You want to die, go and die lah. You want to be taken advantage of or used and abused by people who don't care, don't care about you, you carry on, carry on. And eventually you will all be like that. You will all destroy, devour, eat one another. I told you, right? You're a flock doomed to slaughter. And I took my staff favor and I broke it, annulling the covenant that I had made with all the people. So it was annulled on that day. And the sheep traders who were watching me knew that it was the word of the Lord. Zechariah takes the first staff representing God's blessing, his favor, and he breaks it. He annuls the covenant. He dissolves the covenant. That's how serious it has become. I mean, what's the point in continuing this relationship? If you don't want a relationship, then there is no relationship. You don't want me, fine, I'll go. I won't force you, I'll go. Now God didn't do this reactively, it was not some hissy fit. He was exceedingly patient with them, warned them again and again. It was the word of the Lord for centuries. But in the end, if you don't want me, then forget it, lah. carry on. You own self, settle own self, see what happens, okay? See what happens. Then I said to them, if it seems good to you, give me my wages, but if not, keep them. And they weighed out as my wages 30 pieces of silver. If you don't want me as your king, then pay me. Uh. How much are you going to pay me for services rendered? Uh? I'm an employee to you, right? I'm a slave, right? So where are my wages? I mean, you come to me when you need help. Then when I'm done, you say, bye, I'm done. Services over. Go away. Pay me. Uh. How much am I worth? How much am I worth? 
They pay him 30 pieces of silver, the price of a dead slave. After all, he's just a hired hand to them. Now that God has done his job, he's come and removed all the oppressive leaders, it's time for him to go away. They pay him to go away. You know, when the Pharisees paid out those 30 pieces of silver, it was called blood money. That's what Matthew 27 calls it, blood money. The price you pay for God to die, for God to go away. It's so sad, right? God looks at his people and he sees us as his precious jewel. The ones whom he loves and is exceedingly jealous for. The ones he values so highly and gladly gives his life for. Friends, God gladly gave his life for you. Jesus showed us this. That's how you know how precious you are to him. When we look at the cross, we see the worth God has for us. The worth we are to God. We're worth everything to him. And when... And yet, when we look at God, how much value do we give Him? What's His worth to us? What's the price of Jesus to you? What's the price of Jesus to you? Then the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, the lordly price at which I was priced by them. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and I threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. God takes his wages and he throws it back in their face. He throws it into the temple to the potter, or in some translations, he throws it into the furnace of the house of the Lord. You keep your wages. I am no hired hand. I don't work for profit. I don't see you as a means of income. I am the good shepherd and I care for you. Not like you. You keep your money, your blood money, it will be your destruction. The money is thrown into the furnace of the temple. It's like Jesus flipping the table in John 2, right? The signal that this way of life will no longer be tolerated. Not in God's house, it will be destroyed. Then I broke my second staff union, annulling the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. As soon as the good shepherd leaves, he breaks his second staff union, a signal that once God is no longer in the room, all relationships between his people will shatter. Brother will turn against brother. They're no longer family. They're all just goods and services. I think you all know how business can so easily turn a family against one another, brother against brother, son against father, daughter against grandmother. How many high-profile lawsuits are families fighting for money? But there is no more family. There is no more union. It gets worse. Then the Lord said to me, take once more the equipment of a foolish shepherd. For behold, I'm raising up in the land a shepherd who does not care for those being destroyed, or seek the young, or heal the maimed, or nourish the healthy, but he devours the flesh of the fat ones, tearing off even their hooves. Zechariah is then told to play the part of a, a foolish shepherd, one that embodies their value one that is entirely profit and power driven. That's what they want, what? right? That's what they want, right? A king who will strip mine their nation, that will steal all their riches, that will make everyone into a slave. That's what you want, right? A king that doesn't care at all. He won't look after the young. Children have little value to him. Why bother taking care of them? He won't heal the sick. Let them die. Don't waste your time on caregiving or the disabled. A king who doesn't even nourish the healthy. Just use and abuse people. Get the most utility, productivity, economy you can from the people and then throw them away. 
A king who would eat the meat of the fattest sheep, even the flesh between their hooves. Did you see that? Eat all the meat, even going to the toes. An absolutely profit-driven and power-mad king. That's what you want. And so it happened, right? God raised kings like Nebuchadnezzar, who set fire to the country, burned the trees, took all its wealth, made everyone a slave. And the shepherds wailed and wailed and wailed. That's what you want, right? Well, you always get what you want. You'll get the shepherd you want. The chapter started with a wail, but now it ends with a woe. Woe to my worthless shepherd who deserts the flock. May the sword strike his arm and his right eye. Let his arm be wholly withered and his right eye utterly blinded. In the end, God will judge every leader that does not care for his precious sheep. Every leader that uses and abuses his people who would run at the first sign of danger. God will strike that eye that showed no compassion. God will wither that hand that did not stretch out to save. The flock needs to learn their lesson, yes, but the leaders, oh, the leaders are always subject to God's burning anger. reserved for woeful judgment because they don't care for his sheep. Friends, as long as we see one another as commodities, view profit and power as the highest gains, value trade more than compassion, as long as we don't see people the way God does as precious, Eventually, eventually, we will destroy one another. Why was Israel in such a mess? It was inevitable. They are a flock doomed to slaughter. But friends, let me ask you, is God done? Is God done with his people? I know he made this big drama about breaking the staffs, annulling the covenant, walking away and saying, I don't care, I'm so tired of you, you want to die, just die. So is God done? Well, obviously not, right? Otherwise, Zechariah won't be talking to us. God is not done. As frustrated as he is, he has not given up. He has not run out of compassion. But how is he going to change his people's vision? That is the question. How is he going to change his people's vision? Friends, once again, can I ask you, don't mind. Turn to your left and turn to your right. How do you view these people sitting next to you? When you look at them, what do you see? Now ask yourself, what does God see? Shall we pause and pray? Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Amen.